This Three Beards Media podcast may contain mature themes. And if you're not down with that, we got three words for you. Like the podcast. Nailed it. What is up? <clears throat> Episode three, false starts. Uh, I am Chris Shipley. I've got Bill Blank with me as always. Bill, how you doing tonight? Swell. And you, you're in a, up in Minnesota and in a ho- I'm in, hotel room? Yeah, I'm in the cheapest, crappiest little hotel in Winona, Minnesota. I knew uh, it was I knew it was a crappy hotel because <laughs> when we first started talking off air, I could hear background noise and I was like, you got noise and it's probably your it's probably picking up your heater running or something. You said, Hold on, I gotta turn that off. You didn't walk to a wall no, or a thermostat. You walked over and pushed the off button. I did. Yeah. I did. So I was like, it's, Oh yeah, he's in a super eight or some shit. It, it's half hanging out the wall. I'm not entirely sure that somebody probably hasn't been murdered in this room at one point. Dude, I have slept in so much worse than that. I was I, I got in here and I was like Man, I should the the wonders that they can do with photography nowadays. Oh yeah, this looked a lot better. Size, yeah, this looked a lot better on the photography. What is it? What what's the name of the hotel? It's a Days Inn. Oh yeah, yeah, it's fifty six dollars a night. I mean, I'm not playing. I'm not paying for luxury up here. That's you're lucky. Winona has a Days Inn. I used to do. I did. I used to do uh, some shows there. I probably did three or four shows. There was a. A bar there called, uh, oh man, I want to say the Iron Horse, but I don't think that's right. Some something with a horse in it. <laughs> <laughs> then, I remember I did one. I did a show there once, and um, nobody came. There were two people <laughs> that that weren't staff members, <laughs> and uh, so they made me do the show still for those two people, and some of the staff like hung out in the back and watched oh my god that's and it so ended bad. up being a really fun show actually i drove by the american inn which was like 110 dollars, and it looked like the taj mahal compared to this place compared i was to like days in right i was like man i really should have splurged another 60 dollars and stayed at the american i can't inn. believe it cost it. so was it american inn or americ inn americ inn by window oh, i'm really surprised because usually those those are the those are the polished turds of hotels. It, it looked really nice from the outside. So yeah. again, maybe the inside wasn't super great, but I should have known right off the bat when I got in here and there was no elevator. And I was like, uh, "Okay." Are there more than? Is there more than one floor? Yeah, there's two. There's just two floors. I'm too fat nowadays. I gotta have an elevator. <laughs> it is what it is. For the second floor, <laughs> I can't go up one flight. As I can't. That's, one that's flight. way too much work. That's way too much work. There's only like the three in front of my house when I first get there. Right. I walked in and this was my look uh, when I, uh, oh, darn, I don't have it. (laughs) Hold on and bring it up here. Here we go. This baby right here. This was my look when I walked in here and saw that uh, what I had booked. <laughs> Big brand stare down, dude. I loved every goddamn second of that. I, I knew you would. I knew you would, dude. He hate. Is it not obvious? Is it not obvious that he hates referees for the same reasons I do? Is it not obvious? We've got the same exact <laughs> opinion the, on the whole. You species. Never called one of a motherfucker to their face. Me. I never have, or or he never has, or what? Say what? You never have, right to his face. I'm pretty sure he almost like choked one in a in a hallway one time. Yeah, he probably deserved it. I'm telling you, they're all pieces of shit. <laughs> I'm telling you. Oh, I'm not. Ba- I am not backing day, off. I, like, that. I cannot wait. To t- I cannot wait to talk to Bill Dude, about this stare down. This the the that ref right there is your classic got beat up in high school like 
I, I actually heard a referee say one time, like when you know he was talking about, oh, this is why nobody wants to ref anymore. Burr, 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 you know, doing the woe is me shit. And he's he's like, you know, some of us we just love the game, and it's just, it's, it's the only way we get to compete now. You know, and I'm like, no, you're you're not competing. You're the referee. That's your problem. That's your mentality. You dumb fuck. You just admitted it. <laughs> I coached a. Uh... It was probably an under 12, maybe under 14 soccer team uh, when the boys were on it and my friend's kids were on it. And uh, this referee did not call offsides. It was clearly offsides. Now, granted, Bill, we were up like nine nothing at this point and they scored on this and didn't call offsides. And I'm yelling at the guy going, to, he's clearly offsides. And the ref goes, I, I can't call. I can't make that call. And I absolutely lost my mind. And I was like, for fuck's sake, that's your whole job. You can yeah, why can't you make want. that call? Why not? And then my uh my assistant coach said, Chris, I think that kid's like 15. You might want to calm down. <laughs> yeah. So, well I, that's but that's a whole different that's a that's a kid volunteer. It's little league. That's different. I realized, but I felt kind of bad that I was yeah, screaming yeah. at a 15 year old kid. Sure. But no, in my defense, I, he could make that call. No, I mean I've done that before. I I when I was coaching younger, like my son's basketball and different things. I I remember I remember, but I like I embarrassed myself a couple of times because it was I realized it was a volunteer situation. You know, like I'm, right. It's yeah. not. It's not people getting paid a bunch of money to do anything. I, here's my thing: if you're getting paid money to do it, then you can be criticized. Yes, it's all there is to it. it if you're volunteering your time then you then nobody gets to yell at you then you go yeah. do it but if you're taking money i don't care if it's 50 bucks a game i don't care if it's 50 bucks for the 2 hours that you're there then you are not above reproach like right. you can be criticized you're getting paid no i don't care I, how old I, you are i don't care what's going on 100% and i and and to piggyback off that the fact that they don't have to answer questions and they they're not do not have to be accountable for anything is is not right either. That's no, not right especially, either. especially like NFL referees. The, I'm pretty sure the lowest salary. I could be talking completely out of my ass here, but I remember looking this up, or at least I don't know if it's the lowest salary or the average salary, but they make 250 grand a it's, year. Yeah, it's it's and you know you have to. That's not a full time job, and I read this mm -hmm. somewhere that you have to in the NFL have a job that is a, a, your normal job has to pay you an X amount of certain amount of money per salary, because then at that point they figure you're making that much money, then you're above reproach as far as being able to fix the game. So it's not like they're hurting for money. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Like you have to make like $750,000 or some crazy number in your regular job to even be considered for an NFL job. Now, I don't know. Some of these assholes are already rich. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Fuck them even <laughs> harder. <laughs> fuck them all. Seriously. Why does anybody defend these fuckheads? <laughs> I don't understand. In the way they, it's like, like you were saying, like calling a guy a motherfucker to his face, blah, blah, blah. How many times you seen a referee walk up to a guy like Rasheed Wallace? And talk to him like he could just smack him like he was a kid yeah. and he could just smack around. As if Rasheed Wallace couldn't throw that guy 20 rows into the stands. Like right. that guy would walk up to Rasheed Wallace in a bar and go, shut up, Rasheed. <laughs> Rasheed would knock him the fuck out like that. 100%. That's why I hate him. <laughs> Among other reasons. All right. Well, I also have severe... Mental illness. <laughs> well, it's a good thing we're doing this podcast then. I don't know. Maybe I'm one of those guys like, like, you know how, <laughs> like Michael Jordan always had to have an enemy to, to stay motivated. He had to, he didn't care if it was just like some guy sitting in the stands that looked at him funny. Yeah. Like he had to just have a f villain somewhere. Yeah, I think that's what it is for me when it comes to sports. My favorite teams. And I think this is what something I developed over the years is I have to have a villain 
And the only villain you can always have is the ref. Right. Like the ref is my villain at every game. My villain is not the other team anymore like as much as it is it. the ref. Yeah. It's like the butler did it. Yeah. Cause it's like the, it's always the referee. Well, the other teams, both, both teams are competing and trying to play an honest game to just win the game. Right. The ref is the only one that gets to influence that game in any way that in reality has nothing to do with the game. He has nothing to do with it, but he can influence it. So imagine like even less. He, he has even less to do with the game than the coach does. Well, but uh, he gets to influence it more than the well, coach. Okay. Yeah. I, I think he has much. I think he can influence it just as much, if not more. Uh, but you're, you're right. I, how do you, how do you do that though? Like, and now we're going to go down this whole. Oh, I don't line. have answers. This isn't about answers. <laughs> oh, oh no. That's, this is oh, I don't podcast, have any. We're not oh, giving no. answers. I'm not going to offer solutions to this problem. <laughs> no, that would be the healthy thing to do. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. No, there's no solutions. Just, they just suck as a species. Just straight bitching. That's all it is. Well, because the thing is, there are a lot of people say, "Well, how do you, we need? We got to have them. They're a necessary part of the game, and they are. But but it's a it's a necessary evil. You know what I mean? Right. Like there's all kinds of things in the world that are a necessary evil. But they're evil nonetheless. Paul Paul points out that most cops I know are above reproach for about 12% of that salary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> right? Uh, hey, and they yeah, don't so even what, have to so sit in those other, mobile units. What's your they don't other even job? have to sit in those mobile units and do anything. <laughs> what's your other job, Paul? Do you make over <laughs> do you right. make over 30 yeah. grand? In- other job. <laughs> Paul's second job, he gets a he he gets a certain amount of salary, and that's why he's allowed. <laughs> Joel Clement joining in with us. How you doing, Joel? Thanks for thanks yes. for commenting. Uh, All right, let's let's get to the topic of the hand. See, Paul, I'll never get clearly Paul to solve. To, I'll never get Paul to admit any of this. He might. He might. Because I know he knows these. He knows cops better than I do. Obviously, so. I know that he knows those there's that there's these little groups of people in almost every profession. Right. Right. And so he's got to know some cops that were clearly that got beat up in high school guys. And that's almost 100% why they became cops. I know you have to know some of those guys (laughs) to me. 100% of referees are those guys. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they're all bad at their job and just so you know yeah. we te- I just so they're you know, all I'm- the guy that got beat up in high school and want some control they right? want to control people they want to be disciplinarians to the fucking they, world they, somehow they uh, and just so you know oh, I turned the air conditioner off in here and now I'm sweating to death so oh you have the air on the this- heat yeah Oh yeah, you it's have the air on and not the heat. Here. Yeah, it's hotter really? than hell in here. Yeah. Oh, it's also, because I'm you're fat. on the second floor. Bill. Also, I'm 300 pounds. It, it doesn't matter where I'm at; it's always hot. Well, I mean, I guess there's that. You're, are you the guy that wears shorts in the winter? Yes, yes, and it drives my wife yeah. nuts. Yeah, drives my wife absolutely nuts. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of bigger guys do that. That's because. There's a lot of body heat going on over here. Mm-hmm. But, you know, people didn't tune in to hear about my body heat, Is believe it or not. No, they want to hear about your body dysmorphia instead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't use big words, Bill. I don't know what that means. <laughs> All right. So as we teased at the beginning, uh, Paul wants to know, uh, wants to tell you, don't come out of the basement. (laughs) (laughs) Joel's trolling you with some let's go state. Joel, I don't know if you know this, but we're currently losing the basketball game. So I don't know that we really want to talk shit on here. 
What are is there a men's or women's game tonight? There's a men's game tonight. They're oh, they're playing tonight. Yeah, 39-34. Who they play? They're losing. West Virginia. We suck. I'm so ready for the Big Twelve. Oh, this, this, dude, this is the this is the who can commit the most fouls game. Yes, right, right. Well, at one point, that's got to be brutal to watch. Kalsher was our leading scorer. Uh, we were up by two, 22 to twenty. He got his third foul, sat, and we didn't score another point until two minutes before the half to twenty five. So, uh, it's it, I think Heather tweeted out earlier. It's the ISU Cowshers versus West Virginia at this point because Cowshers the only one scoring anything. Well, let's just all hope Huggins' defibrillator goes off or something. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> hey, nice. you ever? I've, I don't. You know, I was just te- I was just saying this on a radio show in Omaha last week. Uh, if you ever want me to root for Iowa State, all they have to do is play West Virginia because I hate Bob Huggins that much. Yeah, but I will root for Iowa State to beat Bob Huggins one hundred percent of the time. Right, I, I can't stand that guy. But that reminds me of another thing when it comes to refs. Like when when teams get known as a defensive team, I can't stand that because all that means is they're going to grab and they're going to foul and just hope the refs don't call everything. Right. And the refs talk before the game. And they go, "Okay, these are really aggressive physical teams." So we can't call everything or everybody will foul. No, the game has rules. A foul is a foul. Call every single foul. Guess what happens? They have to play the game differently now. Right. They can't do that now. Right. I, I think what bothers me, and then we'll, we'll get to our other topic, but what bothers me the most is is when they they don't they call something a certain way the entire game. So then those players start to adjust. And then at the end of the game, they don't call it the same way they did before. Right, right, yeah. So now, when at the end of the game, if you were expecting to get that call, you don't get it because you've gotten it all. Like, I can't call it. I can't. Right? Oh, I can't call it because I don't want to influence the game in the last three minutes. Well, you've influenced it the entire by not calling the game. Right? Well, you also influenced it for the other team by not calling. Yes, exactly. It's all fucked up. They know. They know. Of course, they know. They get ungodly amounts of money to suck. Ugh. I just honestly, I, I I I wish Fran could have punched that guy. I loved every second of it. I loved every goddamn second of it. And what I loved the most was all the virtue signaling because we're down by like eleven when it happened, with like less than two minutes left when he did that. Yeah. And so all the virtue signaling on Twitter. The, oh, this is just embarrassing. This is disgusting behavior. Uh did you really like lose sleep over it right and if i'm and if and if your coach if your coach with this medium shirt walked over and did the same thing you would have loved it you'd have talked about this is just the so you, know, you can We've check been all this time. you can check my twitter feed i publicly stated i thought it was funny Exactly. It was he didn't he didn't lose his temper. He didn't do the typical Fran. Let's no. you know Fran Con seven. He didn't lose his mind. He just walked over there and looked at him like a disappointed parent. It which was, was hilarious. Which is, like, I, like I have that look on a daily basis to my kids. Well, and then after the game, when somebody asked Ray about it, he just said, I don't know what you're talking about. To me, which again is a typical comedy. parent response. I don't cold. remember doing that. Well, Anytime my kids accuse me of something. The best part is we go on to win the game afterwards. And all of a sudden, the amount of people who thought it was funny just tripled the amount of people who thought it was disgusting. Right. Yeah. Now, had we lost that game, the disgusting people would have won out by a long a long shot. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not going to matter. You guys are going to lose in the first round anyway. So. That's yeah, I mean, story. there's probably a really good chance of that, but I didn't. I didn't think this team was even going to go. To be honest with you, right? That you're playing with house money at this point. I think so. All right, let's take a break. Uh, I mean, we got the same record, and we beat you. Right? Uh, okay, now we're now I I need now I really need a drink from Revelton. <laughs> so, all right, uh, I'm going to get a word from Revelton, and we're going to come back. You keep keep playing with your nipples there, Bill. That's that's what everybody's tuning in for. <laughs> All right. With that segue, here's our ad. Here's our our, our word from our sponsor, Revelton Distilling Company. 
At Revelton Distilling Company, everyone has become a part of the Revelton family. From the Taylors and their daughter who helped perfect their award-winning gins, to the team who installed Lucy, our 33-foot tall custom-made still, right down to the local farms that provide our coveted corn, and even the cows on those farms who consume our mash byproduct. Want to see the farm to flask come to life? Now you can tour Lucy and find out where we take Iowa's harvest and transform it into our finest spirits. Choose between a 45-minute tour or find out even more by scheduling a VIP behind-the-scenes tour to get the taste of the full Revelton experience. You can visit them at 1400 West Clay Street in Osceola, Iowa, or find all of Revelton's award-winning spirits at any local grocery or spirits retailer. All right, and we're back. Uh, I took a trip down there with... uh... With George Trice and Brent Curvey and Coach John Walling, uh, and uh, hung out and took a little tour of Revelton. So if you get a chance, go down there, uh, check out Rob and Chrissy, or pick up uh, some of their stuff at uh, Hyvier or or Fairway. It's good stuff. Yes, sir. All righty, Bill. <clears throat> so we are uh, we're talking about men's mental health on this podcast, and what I come across a pretty interesting. Uh, article from men's health magazine and i thought we would go through some of the some of the meat of it uh it is uh the 21 myths of why men don't talk about their mental health so we'll go through the list here and then maybe we can <clears throat> if either one of us have experienced one of these okay? who's the who's the author it the author is by King. scarlet wrench and joshua david stein this is from May 11th of 2020. So 21 reasons why men don't talk about their mental health and why every single one of them is bollocks, which I think is their fancy word for bullshit. Yeah. We can cuss on this podcast. Try to be British. British. That's right. All right. Number one, there's nothing wrong with me. This article isn't about you, right? You're fine. But here's a crucial thing. Acknowledging that it is useful to work on your mental health doesn't mean there's just something wrong with your brain. Or more than going to the gym or train your triceps, there's something wrong with your arms. It's just a good practice. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. I I agree. I, yeah, I had that. I think we talked about this last episode. Um, my my therapist asked where I was at, like why I kept coming at this point because I've been doing well lately, and I was like, well, it's, I feel like it's important to go when you feel good, right? As well. Although sometimes you go feeling good and you walk out feeling like shit, but that's like part of the work. <laughs> yeah, but that <clears throat> it's like breaking you down and building you back up, though. I think is part of that. hundred percent. Well, it's kind of like, okay, are you really? Yeah, you know, or are you like, just masking? Let's, di- let's dig. Yeah, let's dig a little deeper, and then okay, well, this. Yeah, this bothered me. I mean, a lot. I go once a month, so you're not gonna. Go, I don't think it's realistic to go through a whole month without some something bothering you yeah i i have not i i've not actually gone to a therapist um i have thought about it especially the last few months mm-hmm. uh with everything going on um even even though i don't necessarily <clears throat> the things that i'm going through right now i don't necessarily think are depression as a result of like what's wrong with me that there's something wrong S- with me but situational. because i'm it's situational and 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 I just need some help dealing with a little bit of it I think is is a good example of it. Mm-hmm. So I would say I'm the, I, I I've probably mm-hmm. at sometimes also said nah there's nothing wrong with me it's just seasonal or I'll get over it or whatever. Well, I would encourage you to go and then once you like you said, you know, kind of help getting through the the current situation or whatever. <clears throat> so you go that route and uh then once you get through the current situation, just keep going. Yeah. And then yeah, it's not something see. that I think if I went that I would just go for a little bit and then go, okay, I'm done. Right. Right. I, th- I think there's, th- there's a whole list of things that, that, that I would benefit from it. Yeah. It's, I, th- I feel like it's a long-term commitment on some level, yeah. but you also, I don't think, um, don't be afraid to therapist hop a little bit. I mean, you might not click with somebody. That's okay too. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, sometimes you just, you just don't click and therapy is, 
therapy is not going to help you if you're not 100 percent open so if you don't feel like you can be 100 percent open with someone then you definitely should go to someone else that you can be but i think that's why what we're you know, kind of the gist of what we're doing is important because a lot of us men like if we'll be more open with our friends a lot of time. Yeah. You know, we, we know we can be open with some of our buddies. So maybe at least do that. You know, that's, <clears throat> that's a good point. We, uh, or host a podcast. Right. <laughs> uh, last weekend I, I went on a, on a men's retreat and <clears throat> I won't, I won't get into the religious aspects of it because it, it it's not pertaining to this particular topic, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of, of um, opening up about things in your life that we talked about that was really cathartic. And to be able to have that kind of openness with your friends and, and other men and be vulnerable like that um, is, a, is a pretty big eye opener, I think, for some people. And it, and it is cathartic and it does help and it does give you a space to be able to rely on, on, on your fellow friends and, and things like that. So <clears throat> there was a lot of that going on at that at that men's retreat that I was at that I really relate a lot to what our conversations with were about being vulnerable, being open, not being afraid to share mm -hmm. uh, some of those hardships in your life and things that you're going through. Yeah, I mean, I, go ahead. it doesn't to me, it doesn't matter if it's a religious thing or if it's, um, you know, drinking ayahuasca. Like, if you can get with a group of like-minded people and, you know, discuss your struggles in an open and honest way, it's going to be helpful. I don't care if it's an AA meeting. I mean, AA meetings are some of the best places for someone that needs therapy to go basically get free group therapy. And there's meetings all day, every day. <clears throat> right. You know. Uh, number two. Uh, okay. There. So the first one was, there's nothing wrong with me. Number two, fine, but I don't have a mental health problem. <clears throat> so, so, okay. So this article is written from the perspective of this is what men are saying, why yes. they don't get help. Right. Okay. Yes. Right. So you're acknowledging that something's wrong, <clears throat> but it's not mental, right? It's not a mental health problem. And I think okay. that goes back to the stigma of saying that you have a mental health issue. Yeah. Right. So they don't want to admit um, that you, that they do have a mental health problem. So well, we're only like two generations away from people just thinking you were batshit crazy and just saying that. Right. <laughs> right. Was, yeah. That was your diagnosis. You know? Well, and, th and this, uh, th this, uh, this psychotherapist, uh, Amy Morin, uh, says she advises thinking about it in the same way you do your physical well-being. Waiting until a problem is threatening to derail your routine is a far less efficient strategy than seeking advice when the first symptoms arise. Or to put it another way, most men aren't embarrassed to see a dentist to keep their teeth healthy. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, because you can't blame that on weakness. Right. Right. Mental health issues are especially, I think, I don't think that's a hundred percent pertaining to men. I think that's for anybody, you know, in the past, it's just been in the case where to admit any of these things or talk about them out loud, you were yeah. afraid of being judged for at the very least being weak, but also crazy, you know, um, it's weird because I feel like now, I feel like now I know more people that have some form of anxiety or depression or something. Uh, I feel like I know more people that have issues than don't. Like now oh, when yeah. I meet when I meet somebody that doesn't understand what anxiety is or how what that what it does to a person, I'm like, what? How do you not know this? <laughs> <laughs> how have you not ever felt there's no empathy like nothing yeah i i don't i think it's just because of, of things like what we're doing right we're bringing more awareness to it and things like that so that 
that helps bring those th- those issues out to light. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that when it gets, you know, some in a lot of facets of life, you try to avoid labels, mm-hmm. but mental health to me is something that labels are actually positive because once you label it, you can have some kind of adequate strategy to battle it. Yeah. And you know, once it, you identify it, it's, it's exactly. not even the other problem. Once you identify the problem and I don't know, for me, for men, that's kind of how I'm wired anyways. If I can identify something and know what the problem is, to me, that's half my anxiety right mm-hmm. now. And now, okay, you're giving me a plan to fix it and steps to help me fix it. Okay, now I can I can visualize that, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's how men are wired anyway. Well, I mean, just your logical solution-based brain. Right. But, but at the same time, when that wiring starts shorting out, that that's when you start having your panic attacks and you know what I mean? So sometimes that the, the very thing that makes anxiety an ongoing issue for, I think anyone is that there's no logic to it. Like you can't, you, you can't really, you, you can develop a plan to help a problem of like a physical problem in the physical world. But when it comes to anxiety, it's just always going to be there somewhere. And it's probably always going to come back for you at some point. And when it does, it's like you have amnesia. It's like you don't even remember that it's happened to you before. Right. Like anybody who has had a major panic attack will probably tell you that. Yeah, for sure. You know, when it when it sets in, you know, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time fighting off just little anxiety attacks. I feel something coming. I do too. I've got my tools. I can usually get get rid of it, <clears throat> you know, in that time frame. But when it takes over, it's like all those tools are gone now. Like it's it's got you. And now it's just you just kind of wait. It's almost like waiting it out. It's like having a virus. Yeah. I I sometimes and I've noticed this and and this is probably part of the reason why I I've, I've identified the fact that it probably would hurt for me to go and sit and talk to somebody is, is sometimes I don't see the warning signs until it's too late. And now I'm angry about something or I snap at something or I lose, you know, I I'm, I'm short with the kids or, or, or whatever else uh, because I, I I'm so far now in my head and aggravated about this and that and whatever that I kind of, I snap at the smallest things. And there'll be times where Stacy's like, you know, I, I honestly did not think that me saying this would, would make you so angry. Like, why, why are you so angry about this? And, you know, and then I would initially, I would get defensive and go, well, I'm not angry. I'm just tired of, you know, uh, and then after about mm-hmm. 10 minutes, I'd sit there and think, yeah, well, I had this happen today and I had this happen and I had this happen. And now I've let it build and build and build to the point where you've said something that's not even remotely deserving of how I just acted. Well, you don't. You like forget that you live. You, you forget that you live with other people. Yeah, like, like you forget that you're cohabitating. Yeah. So like you don't get, you know, it's not like you live alone and you get to go home after a bad day at work and just be an asshole to yourself. Right. Like now you get you, you can't bring it home with you. you. That's something that I struggled with. You know that that played that that's always been a major thing with you know, any long-term relationship of mine was I, I struggled not to bring that stuff home with me. Right. And that's why stand, you know, I loved stand up. when I started doing stand up, and I could do it for a living. Like there was no turning back for me because there was nothing. I wasn't happy, but then when other shit would go down and I would get forced to do other things to make ends meet, that's when I was pissed off. Yeah. Yep. All right, uh, we're going to combine three and four here because <clears throat> they're pretty close. I think they're they're reasons why you why you think you don't need to go. So my problems are too complicated to fix, or my problems aren't that bad. I can deal with them myself. Uh, I would say that number four is what I say. My problems aren't that bad. I can deal with them myself. Yeah. Um... 
sometimes for me, I would, <laughs> I don't know, maybe this is like the misogynist in me or something, or I'm not misogynist, masochist. Yeah. Um, I would sometimes say to myself, I just need to go through this. I, and maybe that was the right way to look at it. I don't know. But um, then again, I don't, I'm not any of these because I go to therapy. Right. So like, yeah. But I'm trying to put myself in the frame of mind of when maybe I haven't. I mean, there's a lot of time in my life I didn't have insurance. So I couldn't afford oh, sure. therapy. You right. Know? Yeah. Which is a big motivation for doing this show. Because there's a lot of people out there that that either they can't afford it, um, they don't have insurance. I mean, there's a number of things. Maybe they don't have time. No therapy. Nobody's going to see it at 9 o'clock. Yeah, I you think. Know? So, but sometimes I say to myself, um, whatever this is, because sometimes like, you can't pinpoint what's got you feeling like shit. Right. Be any number of things. So whatever this is, um, there's growth in this for me to go yeah. like go through this. Whatever, whatever, whatever going through that means, you know, there's there's days where you just gotta you have to push things aside to get through the day. I mean, you know, it's not your only other option is to die. Right. <laughs> basically right so, yeah. yeah i mean that's not really an option <laughs> yeah i mean you, i'm just saying you know i don't mean to put that lightly you know um but to make light of suicide or anything like right. that but no, i'm saying like that's that's what happens though when people don't try to develop the tools and they can't cope anymore and it's too overwhelming that's where they go because that's all that's left Yep. Yeah. And that's the last thing most of us want to do. So um to me, you owe it to your loved ones to go get go get the help so that you don't end up in that dark of a place. Cause that that leaves, especially when you have kids, that does long lasting damage. I mean, there's nothing worse is, that a kid can feel growing up. Yeah. That any of their parents didn't love them or didn't want them. Right. So imagine your parent commits suicide when you're eight. You grow up your whole life thinking you weren't good enough for them to stay alive for. Right. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's a whole different level. So you owe it to those people to get help. Yeah. Yeah. You. That you, doesn't you, go away, that damage that that, that <clears throat> does to other people. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Which I think kind of leads into into the next to the next uh myth everyone thinks i have my shit together i can't let them see the cracks and that's a lot of pressure uh yeah that's a big one yeah uh, that, we, that would be the biggest one for me i mean you know it's hard to just completely humble yourself right then and there that was something that uh you know i remember people getting annoyed with me where you know, they would think I was like, had my shit together. So, you know, for lack of a better term. And I'd be like, no, ah, no, not really. I got this going on and this going on, you know? Yeah. And I was just trying to be humble, like in the moment, you know, I was trying to like, tell them like the truth. Like, I want people to respect me for the truth of yeah. what I am or what I'm doing. I don't want them to respect me because of what they think it is. You know I don't want I mean? them to respect my craft because they think I make a whole bunch of money. I want them to respect just what I do, the art. That's it. Yeah. We, uh, at this retreat, one of the things that that I that I noticed were there were a few men that that gave um, what they call witnesses about their about their life and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And on the outside, um, and I knew I knew who they were. Like I, you know, we had done things together at church and things like that. But you you look at them and you think, wow, man, they have the perfect life, right? They live in this beautiful house. They have this amazing family. He has this amazing job. All these things. And then you hear his story, and you realize that he's going through certain things that you never would have under you would have never would have known that he went through. 
and a lot of those things I can relate to. And, mm-hmm. and it, and it brings, it brings you almost a clarity of going, it's okay that I go through this too. Right. And I think that that, that myth is the same thing. If you do let your guard down and you do let people see those cracks, mm-hmm. uh, you're helping somebody. I mean, I, I think sometimes a lot of people will, will think maybe when I, like when I talk about, well, that takes having, more courage. It takes more courage yes, to do that. I think so too. A hundred percent more. It's more respectable. To right. Me. But I, I, I sometimes think, uh, I talk a lot about, you know, going through cancer uh, in mm-hmm. 2017 and I, and I talked a lot about, um, you know, uh, other my divorce and things like that. And I think sometimes I'm afraid people might think I'm talking about that stuff for sympathy, but I'm really not. I'm talking about it because maybe just maybe there might be people out there that are going through the same thing or whatever and can hear somebody that has gone through that and made it through. Right. So it's the Mm -hmm. same thing with this type of stuff. When you're open and honest about your failings and your mental health and so on. If I see somebody that might have the perfect life and the perfect you know, house and he has this amazing job and, and everything else, but he's struggling the same way as I am. I can relate to that then. Mm. Well, and in a way, I mean, if you, you know, you are obviously uh, more religious than I am. I'm, I mean, I'm not really religious at all. Um, I'm agnostic. I'm not an atheist, but right. Um, I just kind of, I always said I belong to the religion of don't be a dick. <laughs> nothing wrong the with best. that one yeah. that's actually not a bad religion <laughs> but i am kind of a dick a lot but usually it's just to be funny but like uh no i mean but you're essentially you are like what you did was a form of therapy and yeah and when you go to church that is a form of therapy your mm-hmm. your therapist in a way is your god right or your minister or or whatever your fellowship is there yeah you know, that is in a way your therapy and your therapists, you know? Yep. So, um, I encourage people that if that's what gives you your peace, then by all means, and that, you know, what's funny is my therapist is religious. My therapist is on totally on the God squad. Right. And she knows I'm not. And so we have these awesome conversations from both sides of the fence when it comes to my mental health. Yeah. Like it, it, we have these, you know, because she, she talks about, cause I always label everything as kind of the universe. I mean, it sounds flaky or whatever, but what, what, what some people call God and whatever the power of God is and blah, blah, blah. I call that just the universe and energy and maybe karma i mean i guess if i had to pick a religion somebody put a gun to my head and was like you got to be religious or i'm blowing your head off i'd probably be buddhist maybe i don't know like I that's can... the kind of stuff that seems like it would work for me yeah you know unless I... there was celibacy is there celibacy involved in buddhism because i couldn't I, do that part I, I don't know i, I... yeah no celibacy uh, <laughs> the body the body of I can't. Like you're kind of, you're, you're doing the man pong I said. I said I if it. I've got the body of a temple of a Buddhist, so I've got that down. But that's about the only Buddhism thing I got going. Maybe you should switch it up. You'd be sought out. <laughs> Maybe I should. Maybe I should. Listen, <laughs> I started my witness over the weekend with with the phrase, "I'm probably not your typical Catholic." So, uh, you know, I, I I'm on board with the whole. Uh, I'm kind of a believer that I, Jesus doesn't believe in hypocrites, right? I, so, I, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, I, I I can't imagine we're going to go off on a big tangent here, but I mean that's what we do here. Yeah, I can't okay. imagine that if a doctor is out there and he's saving kids at, at cancer and that's what he's dedicated his entire life to, but he just happens to be gay, that when he gets when he dies, God's going to go, nope, sorry, you're not you're not allowed. I'm just not buying that. So that's really hard to buy. Right. No kidding. And, and by the way, is the, but is the is the priest that you moved to the other church that just raped a little kid? Is he going to heaven, though? Right. Like, 100%. What? No. But come on, man. Right. <laughs> no, I had a great um, 
back in the day when Ross and I and my buddy John Bush, we did a podcast. We, uh, and it was just called the Blank and Bush Show. And um, <laughs> Ross was our producer. But he was just as big a part of the show as, as us. Right. And uh, we did it at the High Life. It kind of inspired the live shows from the High Life, you know, bait shop and stuff on KXNO. Yeah. After that. Um, but we would go in there and we had um, Bill. Um, God, I can't remember his last name off the top of my head. But anyway, he was Bruno's father-in-law. Yeah. He was a retired Methodist preacher. And so I'm, I'm talking to him about religion. I mean, I'm digging deep, you know? Right. And like at one point he goes, you still, are you on a spiritual journey? And I go, yeah, I kind of am kind of <laughs> all the time. Cause I just think <laughs> like, I just think it's like arrogant to think yours is the one out of all of them in the world. Like out of every religion that ever came about ever. Like, right. don't you think it's a little arrogant to be like, no, I mine's right. All my people are going to heaven. If you don't believe in God the way I do, you're going to hell. Like, and I know not every Christian religion is like that or other religions, whatever. I know they're not all like that, but, but a lot of them are, you know, that whole, yeah, they are. There's a lot of, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ and accept him into your heart and get baptized, you're going to hell no matter what. Yes. Like, I can't buy that, right? No. Nope. And and this guy, he he agrees. You know, he agreed, and he made a great point. You know, because he was just basically saying, "God is love. God is love. God is love." That's his whole thing, right? And I can get behind that. Yes. And he's like, and what he said was, "You think somebody like Anne Frank went to hell?" <laughs> right. No. <laughs> no way. No right. way. Anne Frank is burning in hell right now right i mean if if this stuff is real <laughs> right yeah exactly if Anne frank's burning in hell dude i'm sorry we, that's none of us have I a want, chance yeah that's where i want to go right none of us have a chance at that point i don't want to be what you got to be to get in the pearly gates if Anne frank's burning down there no kidding <laughs> yeah right no i'll pass on that deal uh number six Having a mental health problem means I'm weak. We've talked about that. Yeah, we kind of covered that. Yeah, yeah we've covered that. Uh, and I don't want people to judge me. Uh, Another we, thing. We've we kind of covered yeah. that. Yep. I, I think this is first interesting. Of all, first of all, too, yep. really quick, I'm sorry. But, no. like, first of all, the thing about people judging you, number one, no one's going to judge you if they don't know. You don't have to tell anybody you're going to therapy. Right. You just go and you, and who are you going to, who's going to know you're going to therapy unless it's someone else in the waiting room when you get there. Right. Or your so family. They're, not, they're right. there for or your the family, same reason. Or your spouse, maybe. Yeah. But, but I would think, I, depending most spouses, on who you're I think to, most women would applaud their, yes, their, absolutely. their partner going. Yeah, because they know Prefer they know it. what kind of a bear they're living with or, yeah. or or tortured soul they might be living with. Well, and women women are, I think, more likely to go to therapy. So Yeah. You know, I think that uh um just anything you know, because mental health I consider to be a medical thing. I, I do think too. it's all medical, right? I do too. And women are way better at medical stuff. Yeah, Shit, listen, I haven't I, been to the doctor in 20 plus years, probably. Listen, I the, the morning that I passed out twice, uh, when I when I got diagnosed that day, uh, I refused to go to the hospital that morning. I passed out twice, Bill. <laughs> and my wife's like, You've got to go to the hospital. And, and she called the ambulance. And the ambulance guy is like, You got to go to the hospital. Right. And my response was, No, I got to go to work. Yeah. That that was my response. I've got to go to work today. And finally he convinced me, he said, Listen. You go to the hospital. If there's nothing wrong, you'll still get out of there in time to go to work. That yeah. was the only thing that convinced me. Now, imagine if if my wife would have just relented and then I got in a car and I drove to work and passed out. Yeah. Kill somebody else. Right. Guess what? Yeah. I, I listened to the doctors from now on. I listened to my wife. Yeah. That was a good move. <laughs> right. 
I don't want a therapist to judge me either. That's and that's a tough one. That and that's what I was talking about way before we got into this when I was encouraging you to go to a therapist. Yeah. That's exactly it. If you feel judged, then go to another therapist. Right. Like that's what I love. Like I said, mine's on the God Squad. I had the, we had the best conversation last week because I was advocating her, to her that I think everybody should at least try most drugs. <laughs> and, I was like, <laughs> and she's never even smoked weed in her life, right? Right. So like, I'm like, I'm like, not like, I don't mean the bad, the super bad ones. Right. I'm not like, talking shooting up meth. That's not. Uh, yeah, I don't about. think anybody should do meth. I don't think anybody should do heroin, but like, I think, I think Coke maybe is okay. Like trying it. I've never, I've actually never even tried Coke or crank. I thought it was gross, but putting stuff up my nose seemed gross. Yeah. But like, Uh, that's a hard no for me, by the way. Yeah. That's why I never tried it. And I'm also pretty high strung, like naturally. (laughs) Like I have to, ch- I I'm a depressant guy. I need stuff to chill me out, not right. stuff to get me up even yeah. more. Um, right. You don't need to be any more paranoid than you already are. Well, I you know I'm I'm pretty chill most of the time, but my brain's not. Yeah. I'm physically a pretty chill dude, and I'll get passionate obviously about some things in conversation, but like I'm not a I'm not a fucking let's go get them guy. You right. know, I don't jump out of bed and wait to attack the day. You know, I don't do that shit. But well, I mean, I think, what do you get up at like eleven? <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody. I think, but I do think everybody should try. I don't think other drugs are bad. Like, there's, I think, I think smoking weed is perfectly okay. It's archaic that it's not federally legal at this point. I, I mean, agree, hundred really percent. I agree. Um, it's not something I would do, but I do think it should be legalized. Uh, <clears throat> I would, t- I totally am all about people trying acid, trying shrooms. Hell yes. Try that shit. It's a blast. I'm not going to sit here and tell you <laughs> any, they're always trying to tell you fucking scary stories and no, it is a fucking blast and you should try it once or twice. I think the closest I came to, I sniffed glue one time. That was about it. That's close. Dude, the, you know what? The last time I was going through it really hard, like in the last like year, probably in the last two, last two, three years, probably I want to say a year and a half in, I was like through the roof every day. Like I, I was just, <clears throat> I was devastated by what was going on in my life. I was like, Obviously, depress anxiety constantly. One of my friends finally convinced me to eat some shrooms one night, and yeah. I had the time of my fucking life, and I felt great for like a week after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, sorry, not sorry. I'm mean, some <laughs> people probably gonna get mad at me, tell me I shouldn't advocate for these things, or you know, I don't know, man. It's harmless to me. It's all hippie shit to me. <laughs> That's why we run that disclaimer at the beginning of all our podcasts. Yeah, adult content. I'm just saying, man, you know, like I've read up. I'm thinking, I'm literally thinking about going to an ayahuasca retreat. I'm I'm literally, I'm really thinking about it. To what? An ayahuasca retreat. What is that? Is that that Uh, Aaron Rodgers? That's what Aaron Rodgers did, yes. (laughs) You know, he only lasted two days. Well, oh, on it, this that's his latest thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's not, but not the ayahuasca thing. Oh, okay. You're talking yeah, about ayahuasca you is did. different. Ayahuasca yeah. is like old shaman shit. Like it's, it's out there, dude. And people say it's life changing. Everyone that I've I ever mean, known, everyone that I've ever known that's done it, it changed. They tell me it changed their life. So I'm, I'm thinking about it. It's kind of expensive though. I'm out then. I, I I'm unemployed. I can't afford that. Oh, dude, yeah, I, I can shit. just go to my basement for four days in a hole. Could hold. you imagine? This would be the best podcast ever if I could convince Chris to fucking go to an ayahuasca. We, we did talk about homework before the next two weeks. I'm afraid that's what you're gonna <laughs> yeah. assign me. Yeah, you gotta eat shrooms and 
before our next before our next podcast. Oh, this is about the time of the show that Stacy's already tuned out, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number nine. Uh, I wouldn't even know what to say. And number ten, I just don't want to be a burden. On uh, who? Yeah, I don't. I don't know that the burden thing. That doesn't I'm, even I'm make going, sense. I'm going with. I, I could say I could see I wouldn't even know what to say, but then again, to your point, that's what the therapist is for. That's right? their job. Yeah, that's their job, not yours. Yeah, their you're going to go down too. a roll, whatever that, whatever path they're going to pull you through. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So again, to your point, find a good therapist, and if you're not feeling like you're getting anything out of it, therapy, you know, therapist, jump, move it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, my therapist at one point pointed out to me it was it was crazy um i was telling her about something which it's a subject we'll probably cover at some point we'll get into it so i'm not gonna you know it's too late now and i'm not gonna get into it details wise but i was talking to her about something that happened to me during childhood that um i always said didn't bug me didn't bother me yeah uh always and she goes, well, how, how often do you think about it? I go, every day. It crosses my mind every day. Mm. And she's like, well, then it does bother me. <laughs> yeah. And then I just started bawling right. and was like, oh, my God, it does. <laughs> 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 and I was just, I was going, oh, oh, yeah. I, yeah. And then I, I turned into a. Uh, I turned into fucking Chunk with his hand in the blender. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I leaned over the head and I puked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, we are halfway through this list. Uh, I did, I'm going to take our last break uh, and get a word from Brown Dogs Farm. Hot sauce and ranch. Uh, check them out uh, on the web, the local in Norwalk, homemade stuff. We're going to get an, uh, a word from them and then we'll come back and we'll finish this list up. And then we're going to talk about real quick, uh, a couple upcoming guests that we got coming up on the pod. So uh, with that, uh, we will be right back. Brown Dogs Farm are Norwalk, Iowa made hot sauces and dressings. Brown Dogs Farm was born out of the dream to emulate the simple life of Rob's grandparents who inspired him with their hard work and abundant gardens. Rob and Amanda set out to create a unique blend of fruit and pepper that would satisfy the part of the brain that craves great flavor without sacrificing the spice of the peppers. Sweet, but still packing heat. With combinations like jalapeno green apple, habanero peach, cherry rhubarb reaper, and other great flavor combinations, there is a spice and flavor that is right for any party or get together. BDF also has homemade versions of their classic and spicy ranch that are one of a kind. You can order all of those and more online at www.browndogsfarm.com and ask your local grocery to stock up. All righty. You always get all glitchy when we come back from there. Yeah. That's a good thing, but it has its limits. Sometimes men think talking to their partners. What's that? <laughs> I couldn't. I didn't get any of that. I don't know if it went out at all. Yeah, Every time I we think... come off of one of those commercials, it's your uh, obviously the yeah. internet in your hotel, right? Because this hotel is a shithole. Yeah. So they're not yeah. exactly paying. So for... start that one over. Yep. Uh, I talk to my partners, and that's <laughs> enough. Uh, but do you? No. Would be like, that, you know. I would, I would go back to the other one. I'd be more afraid to talk, to be that open with my partner and be judged than I would a therapist who's a stranger. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's kind of what makes therapy good for people or better for people is it's a stranger, a total stranger, and you're not going to see them out in the world. Right. And they, by law, can't talk about you to anybody. Yep. So, you know. Yeah. Although it was funny one night, my therapist came walking out of a show at the Funny Bone. <laughs> she was she was fucking hammered, dude. It was hilarious. 
Did she heckle you? That would have been even better. No, hey, she, remember that time that you were bawling on my couch? She came out. And was, <laughs> she was like, oh, yeah, you were meant to do this. This is definitely what you were supposed to do. <laughs> uh, 12 and 13 are combined. I always feel better after a pint or a workout instead of going to therapy. You can do all of those things. And still go, right? Also, I don't know that I would advocate uh, I'm feeling depressed and I need to work on something, so I'm going to drink. That seems like a bad idea. Yeah, it's weird. Um, I go back and forth when it comes to the alcohol because it's like it doesn't it doesn't take anything away. You know, whatever's going on is still there. When you sober up. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes, man, like, you've been curled up in a ball for a week and you're just like, you need to go take the edge off. Like, just try to have some form of a good time. Yeah. You know? I mean, so I kind of go back and forth on that. And also, if you get, super, you know, if you got like a super hangover the next day, a lot of times... That's really a, like you call it anxiety. Mm. Like I got a buddy that called it, called it that one day. He's like <laughs> it's anxiety, and I'm like that is a hundred percent. Like I've been I've been to where like I was so hungover and just anxiety riddled the whole day, you know, until until I got rid of the hangover. Yeah, so, and, and 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 you didn't fix anything. Exactly. Right? No. So the next morning, not only do you feel the same shit that made you want to have a drink. But now you physically yeah. feel like shit. Yeah. So th that's what I mean. You kind of got to weigh it, you know? Yeah. How good of a time did I have? Right. Because you also got to look at that. However, like, let's say I went out at seven and I got home at four in the morning. I wouldn't have had a good time during that time frame had I not gone out. Right. I would have still been curled up in the ball. Yeah. I might, you know, I had some anxiety. <laughs> I still would have had the anxiety the next day. I still would have felt all the same shit the next day. So at least from 7 to 4 a.m., I had a good time. Right. Yeah. So it's just, that's what I mean. I mean, I go back and forth on it. Because if I'm being honest, it definitely, it definitely doesn't help long term. And I think yeah. that's where people turn into like, you know, alcoholics and. Right. You yeah, know, you're just that. masking it with the short. Then term. it becomes an doing. everyday thing, and then an everyday all day thing. Yeah, you know. But if you're drinking a couple times a week, and you're a single person, and what I mean, what are you supposed? To, what the fuck are you supposed to do? I don't know. I don't know how these people have a fucking good time without any chemicals. <laughs> The fuck just are you? Blurring. We're just blurring the lines you? on this podcast. Who the fuck are you? <clears throat> right? Well, because that's that's my point, though. The the lines are blurred, and people want to make it black and white, and it's not. Mm -hmm. Everybody, when it comes to mental health, in my opinion, everybody has to find their own tools. Everybody has to find what works for them. And I am never, I am not advocating for the use of illegal drugs on a regular basis to combat these things i'm saying there's experiences you can have that'll open your eyes you can have experiences that that are unconventional those help you short term sometimes yeah. you need little short-term victories little tiny victories along the way to create bigger ones right and of course, ultimately, you can't fucking get drunk every day. You can't do, all, you know, you can't be all fucked up every day. Right. But come on, man. Let's not. I, I just said, I think I hate the way people lie about certain things. You know, it's almost like propaganda. Yeah. It's like when you tell everybody that, like, when you just do this blanket coverage and you're just like, drugs are bad. It's bullshit, dude. Shrooms are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> they, they just I, I mean, I'll, I, I, I'm not, I'm not educated enough to, to be able to speak to it. Cause I have, <clears throat> it, 
right? So yeah, I and, and it would be, it wouldn't be right for me to 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 tell somebody that that's bad, or or that's not a good idea. I I don't know. It's it, it's a personal choice, which is what I've chosen not to do, and that's okay. But to your point, you're not advocating that it's a crutch that you do all the time or that that's how you mask it up. That's not, that's no. not what you're advocating for. No, I'm just advocating for just different experiences. Right. I'm, I'm advocating for throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. Right. You know, because ultimately, especially when it comes to being diagnosed with anything, it's either that or the pharmaceutical companies have a hold of you. I mean, right. I, it's, it's six of one half a dozen of the other, in my opinion. That's the argument that that I would make for for medical and, and for marijuana in general to legalize mm -hmm. marijuana in general. There's a number one reason why that's not that's not federally legal, because the pharmaceutical com com companies would rather pop you full of a bunch of psychotic drugs that they're making, and 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 make that kind of money and that kind of profit off of it. Well, and you know who else makes a lot of money off of it being illegal? privatized prisons yes and prison prison guard unions right because of the amount of people that are in jail for it right you know you don't need as many prison guards if there aren't as many people in jail right well job security here's, for this. here's here's an idea we let the people out that are that are out on marijuana and then guys like marty terrell aren't sitting at beer can alley with a with an ankle bracelet on out too early because he robbed money from a bunch of people yeah, I mean that's, that's a whole nother episode. He's he's out now with an ankle bracelet, dude. He was he. Do do you not know? Well, first of all, do you not know the story between? Me I, and yes, and I, I know. I mean, I know that. I, yes. I I was at Beer Can Alley ye uh, yesterday for the drink game watch, sitting at a table, and I turned around, and there's Marty Terrell sitting at a table, ten feet from me, and I jokingly said, "Oh, I should go say hi," uh -huh. and Paul said. No, you should not, <laughs> which is the reason why we didn't tell you he was sitting over there to begin with. <laughs> so, yeah, I was a little taken aback that Marty Terrell, I knew he was out, but I did not, I did not expect to see him at a KXNO sanctioned. Uh, yeah, no shit. Party. I didn't that, know, you talk about somebody. I didn't know that was a KXNO thing. Yeah, yeah, it was. Oh, my God. Yeah. All right. Dragging up old stuff just sounds miserable. Uh, and we'll combine this one. Once you start addressing this stuff, you're never done with it. Uh, I'll jump in first. Dragging up old stuff just sounds miserable. I mean, I don't know what you think therapy is going to be, right? You're not going to talk about what happened yesterday. There's underlying factors. As far as the other one goes, once you start addressing this stuff, you're never done with it. Good. That's mm -hmm. That goes back to your point that it's not like it's a magic fix. And then after six weeks, you're, you're, you've, you've finished this program and you're done. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it, it's a continued, it, to your point, it's a medical, right? So if I have a medical thing that I need to have, uh, dialysis, right. Then I have to go every time I have to go right. for the, you know, for the rest of my life until I get it fixed medically a different way. It's the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what was read that first part again? The first part was I don't want to bring up dragging up old stuff sounds miserable. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you said it it is miserable. Um my grandpa used to say had this great saying, and it wasn't it didn't pertain to mental health, but <clears throat> he uh he used to say they don't spell work F U N. <laughs> and uh <laughs> It's a great, great. It's a great saying. It's a, it's a, it's a nugget. There's, there's I don't know if he made it up. That. I don't know if my grandpa made it up, but that's who, that's who I heard it from. He said they don't spell work f u n, and there's a yeah. I mean, it's very true, and right. that's that's what this is. This is work. Yep. You know, it's um. I mean, this is part. To be honest with you, this is part of our work. What we're yeah. doing right now is part of our own work on our own mental health. We are being open and honest about it to each other at the very least. We don't know how many people are listening or watching at any given time. I mean, we might know that. I don't know. I don't pay attention. But, you know, we, <clears throat> this is part of our work. And so, yeah, that stuff is miserable and that's the work portion. Right. 
but it's it's one of those things that it's like you know in aa they say when you're an alcoholic you're always going to be an alcoholic yeah you're constantly a recovering alcoholic right yep and there's people out there that don't agree with that mentality and i i have some problems with it you know here and there um you know like you can never be cured of alcoholism i don't think that's true necessarily Mm -hmm. but i do think that you can never be cured of mental illness as a whole it's a constant it's like you said it's like if you have um to take insulin every day the rest of your life well this is the same thing how how bad would how shitty would your daily life be if you didn't take that insulin right the brain is the most complex right piece of of organ that you have in your entire body why is that not treated the same as any other organ body part in in, in that that doesn't make any sense to me yeah well unless you have to do remove a tumor or something you know unless there's right. something physically on there surgic that can be surgically removed but you know but look at the history i mean we're we're not that far away from them just drilling a fucking hole in the back of your neck and shit like (laughs) i feel like they used to do that already (laughs) that's what i'm saying no i'm saying we're not that far away from that right oh yeah yeah yeah. we're not that 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 was the treatment before right yes yeah like that literally wasn't that long ago in the grand scheme of things Mm -mm. so we've obviously made great strides but there's gonna be some uh there's gonna be mistakes made still along the way yep you know i think that maybe um was that were those the last two now we've got a couple more here we'll go through them real quick here yep we'll go through them real quick well go go ahead. ahead go ahead no finish your point i forgot Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, some of these are all kind of the same. I, I mean, they're not. They're not super. I, I don't think they're. I think they're, these are fillers, right? But uh-huh. and we've talked about it. What if all my friends find out? Uh, I just find all this talk about mental health about millennial, a bit millennial. We've talked about that as far as generational. What yeah. that's like. Uh, my work schedule wouldn't accommodate it. That you know. I, I think here's a here's a good one. Then we'll finish up with this one. Uh, I have so many other things to deal with right now. My mental health just isn't high on my list. Yeah, it should be number one. Yeah, in my I, humble opinion. I think so too. I think everything else falls into place if you. It's like building a team around a great center. Yeah, you know, your brain is the center, or a great player. You know, just a. A joke could be a just a great player building a basketball team out of, around one guy, a LeBron yeah. or a Michael Jordan. You know, you, your brain, your brain is the superstar, and so you take care of the superstar first and foremost, and let everything fall into place around him. Yep. Yeah, when you prioritize it, uh, it's kind of like that whole. <clears throat> organization or or any other thing you said the cold cell mass is all gonna fall into place. Yeah, well start start that again because I don't think anybody heard it. Yeah, this stupid Wi Fi sucks ass. Up. Yeah, I yeah, go ahead. To, Sorry. That's okay. Uh, it's it's just like when they talk about culture in, in football programs or whatever, right? Once that culture is mm-hmm. set and you have certain things that you want to dial in on culture wise, all those other aspects are going to fall into place. Championships, mm-hmm. you know, the, the winning streaks, uh, individual accolades, all those things are going to fall into place. It's the same thing when you put your mental health and and make that a priority. Uh, all those other things, all those other ailments you have are going to be easier to deal with. Whether it's work or family life or sure. or whatever else you, you, you're you going through. When you got to think of everything as the, you know, there's always a, the center of everything somewhere in every facet. So, like, I, I always thought, I don't even remember who said it to me. It might have been my sister. But at one point, someone said to me, like, the best fa- the best favor you can do your kids is love their mother. Yeah. So when you do that, 
everything else falls into place. You do yeah. everything through that lens and everything else falls into place. And, you know, <clears throat> shit happens. And sometimes you fail to realize that. Right. And then sometimes you get in situations where you can't. Oh, you I, know? I, I yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm, you know, I divorced my son's mom I, in my twenties, you know, I, I, I divorced. I mean, was, I, I divorced my first wife and, and there were reasons. So yeah. I, I totally get it. And if you don't, but it, the thing is, if you don't love their mother, then the best thing you can do is love them away right. from her. Yes. You yep. know, but like, but it's the same concept. Yes. That's the 100%. center. Everything else builds around it. I think it's mental health totally is number agree. one, you know. That's right. So uh, next episode, we are uh, super excited because uh, I reached out to uh, Lindsey Fennelly, uh, who is <clears throat> former Iowa State basketball player and uh, wife of assistant coach uh, Billy Fennelly uh, on Coach Ben, ben Philly's, Bill Fennelly's staff uh, for Iowa State basketball, women's basketball. She's uh, a well-known speaker uh, and uh, has uh, her mental health pretty out there and the struggles that she's went through. And she's graciously agreed to come on. Fall starts with us uh, in two weeks uh, live on our show. Uh, she's going to talk about her her story and uh, hopefully open up uh, some questions of, of how we can kind of translate that into getting other people to talk about it. So <clears throat> uh, special thanks to, to Lindsay for agreeing to come on mm -hmm. uh, with, with Bill and I. I imagine then, she's got some statistics to back a lot of stuff up too. That's, I'm sure she does. You know, that, yeah. I, that's something that I really want to get into, you know, as we go on is these, is the numbers, you know, I mean, we can Google stuff, but I'd like to hear some people with some expertise and that can really just kind of talk about those numbers in the context of a conversation, you know? Yeah, I, I do too. And uh, in that, in that conversation, when I reached out to her, uh, I had a gentleman reach out to me. Uh, he is, uh, a suicide prevention advocate, uh, and he had, uh, reached out to me and said that, uh, if we were interested, he would love to, uh, to come on and talk about his story. He's got a little, uh, uh, he's part of the veterans crisis line and just his little blurb here says, as a staff sergeant, I struggle with depression and suicidal thoughts, but I chose to live. So working out some details on that to have him come on and talk about uh, talk about that and his struggles. Absolutely. As well. so, so it's super exciting that people are seeing what we're trying to do here and want to be a part of it and want to help. Oh, yes. uh, and we and so if there are anybody out there that that has uh, some connections or, or or would like to come on and talk with Bill and I, uh, we would love to and we would love to have you. I do. Uh, I do have a friend uh, we talked about. He's uh, he's going to be in Australia until the middle of March. Um guy i uh, went to high school with it uh ended up being a psychologist um so he's he'll be able to come on and, and shed some light i uh i don't want to say his name yet because he doesn't use his real name on facebook so i don't know if he's what he's gonna want me to call him when he comes <laughs> on <laughs> but um but anyway uh so that's gonna be good uh, you know we i i definitely want to have some experts thrown in here i'm you know, I, I really want to, um, well, you know, really want it to build to where there's a lot of people seeking it out just just to feel better, just to get some shit out there, relate to some stuff. And hopefully um, I don't blur the lines too much. No, nope. you know, I, I, I think that yeah, I think that's kind of the beauty of this is where you and I we're on we're on pretty opposite ends of the spectrum on some things and then we're we're right on right on board with each other on others so i agree there'll be enough challenging things that'll happen that we'll be able to look at both sides of the fence everything no i totally agree totally agree so that episode with Lindsay will be march 13th we're going to go an hour earlier at 8 p.m live uh on facebook and and youtube and and our twitter account so uh bill we're gonna wrap it up here uh mm -hmm. you know we'll have uh make sure that you guys are checking out all of our uh podcasts on the on the three beards media network uh www.threebeardsmedia.com uh sigh of the storm hot mess happy hour with the s'more chicks or with the wing chicks with they're a bunch of iowa fans and annoying and uh and i'm i think their next episode is going to be uh caitlin clark all day every day from the logo 
So, <laughs> so with that and Bill's prowess and 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 T-shirt, uh, we thank you guys for listening, uh, and you guys have a great night.